Welcome, everybody. My name is Adam Petrikoff. I'm the managing partner of VR Business Brokers here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I am excited to have Walker Dibel on today. And the first thing you may say is, who is Walker Dibel and why is he on here? Walker is a fellow broker with Quiet Light, and also um, he is he's an entrepreneur. Uh, in the business brokerage space. He has uh, is also a best-selling author of Buy Then Build, How Acquisition Entrepreneurs Outsmart the Startup Game. And he also has uh, another organization called the Acquisition Lab. And we're going to jump into all of those in a minute. But Walker, is there anything you want to say or add or uh, delete from, from how I described you? No, that's that's great. I've 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 started companies. I've I've bought companies. I've sold my own companies. I, I like to think, and I've brokered a lot of deals. And so I like to think that um, when it comes to entrepreneurship, I like to think that I've actually been in every seat. Uh, there's a few industries I haven't acquired in yet, and uh, slowly working that direction. Well, great. Well, many of you may wonder why Adam would you have a fellow broker on? This is this is it, it doesn't make sense. And Walker and I uh, subscribe to the same theory when buying a business or or helping one of our clients sell a business, and that is uh, education rules. Those who are educated, those who understand, those who know how the process works, increase their odds significantly on being more successful. So with that, we're going to get started here. Just a, a little disclaimer. Um, this is for information purposes only. We're not giving specific advice. These are generic concept strategies, but they should help you acquire a business. Um, and this is what we're going to cover today. Um, I'm going to leave this up there for a minute. We're going to talk about it, and then I'm going to take this off and really let you, you see Walker and, and hear what he has to say. But we're going to start with the basic premise. You know, why should you should you start a business or should you buy a business? You know, we're going to turn the lens around on to our attendees and take a serious look at you. Uh, talk about the search for a business and how you analyze a business. Uh, convincing the seller that you're the right buyer for the business and then making an offer and closing a deal followed by the post acquisition and execution. Finally, we're going to come back with some common mistakes uh, to avoid. Um, we, we see lots of things out there. And uh, if we can give you one, one tip to help you uh, avoid a very common mistake, we think it'll be very helpful. So with this, I'm going to um, get us started here, Walker. So let, let's just talk with the premise. Why should someone consider buying a business versus, versus starting a business? Let, let's just start there and, 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 and stay there. Sure. I, I think it's one of these things, Adam, where, um, you know, I've tried to, I tried to start a couple of businesses like in my 20s and early 30s, right? And the problem I kept having was that I kept not actually succeeding, okay? And the thing is, is we all, we all know it going in, right? We just sort of want to take that Han Solo approach of like, don't tell me the odds, like I got it, right? But the truth is, is that starting a business, right? It's sort of like, we all sort of know this axiom that like 10% of entrepreneurs kind of make it, right? When I talk to entrepreneurs, they actually believe the number is a lot lower, okay? Uh, but um, it wasn't until later when I was like reading Scaling Up and, and, and engaging with a lot of the work by Vern Harnish that I started having this understanding, this realization that 96% of companies in the United States actually never exceed a million dollars in revenue. So like while I was in business school, I would completely ignore these little tiny companies that were a million in revenue. And I started realizing like, wait a minute, so what you're telling me is 10% of startups succeed, and out of the 10% that succeed, 96% of those never exceed a million dollars in revenue? Like, that's just like absurd, right? And so we like to look at, um, you know, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and all these like sort of iconoclastic entrepreneurs, and we think we're gonna be one of them. And sometimes people are, sometimes it works out. Uh, but uh, the thing is, is, is the truth is, is most entrepreneurs that I know are, are not starting a sort of P Peter Thiel zero to one type, like creating a new reality. They're usually doing something like, hey, I've got this skill set and I want to start doing it myself. I might start an electrician company. I might start an SEO company. I might, you know, just start doing services for, you know, whatever it might be, dentist, dentistry, legal, you know, whatever it is. And so the thing is, I started realizing like, wow, a million dollars is actually pretty low, pretty small for being so exceptional, right? So exceptional. And with a couple of things, you know, I, I kind of started to realize like, like 
acquisition entrepreneurship, meaning starting, starting by buying, okay, a couple things happen. When I was hanging out with entrepreneurs, they're all raising money, right? And we were too. And, and the concept was really when you think about it, people are raising money in order to build an infrastructure that then will generate revenue and hopefully earnings because without those earnings, you never become sustainable, okay? When you buy a business, okay, it comes with revenue, it comes with infrastructure, it comes with earnings. And so I kind of like to think of it as like the money ball of entrepreneurship, like get on base, like tie your shoes, get all the things that make sense done first, and then start, you know, building towards that company that you want to have that's in your image that, you know, it, where you can bring innovation and leadership and, 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 and uh, financial well-being for your, your family and your, your legacy and all those kinds of things. And so the thing is, is I also had this realization that when people are raising money for startups, okay, it's really because they can't just go to the bank, okay? Like, 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 like a, a bank loan is the cheapest uh, capital that's out there, right? And when you buy an existing company, it brings these sort of like real estate economics to it, right? And you're able to go to a bank, say, hey, look, I'm buying this, this thing that's going with employees and revenue and customers and infrastructure and secret sauce and all the rest of it, Will you give me a loan to buy it? And they say, we would love to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right? they will. Yeah. So it's just a faster way to sort of like get the, the initial entrepreneurial milestones under your belt. Okay. So I, I obviously, I, I think this is a, a, a great strategy. And it's, it's amazing that, it's, that um, how many people don't understand what they have to, what they have to do personally. So let's, let's talk about, the buyers or potential buyers who are on this uh, on this webinar, and we have some advisors, some wealth advisors, and some attorneys, accountants as well. Some of your clients may may you know want to watch this. So, what, what are the things that you sort of talk to your potential buyers about taking a hard look at themselves? Because if they don't do that, they're not going anywhere. So, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I, I think that. Um... So look, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by the success that By Then Build has had. Okay, I mean, I just, I never could have imagined. I mean, I kind of hoped, but like, I never could have imagined. I mean, I met, I met with somebody last week um, and uh, she started crying because it just changed her life so much, right? And, and here's where I'm going with this, is that, you know, when I first wanted to, when I, when I was like, in 2004, I first was like, well, I knew there's a way to like, a, like buy a business that's already up and running, right? And I was maybe 27 and I was kind of talking to friends of mine. They're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you just like buy the business. They're like, oh, it must be nice. You must be rich or whatever. I'm like, no, 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 you get a bank loan. And they're like, what? Like, it was just like, what? And, and um, so the thing was, was I, I knew there was a way to do it. And as I went out to try to figure it out, okay, it was a very opaque and fragmented marketplace, okay? Like it was just sort of like little pieces and little clues, right? And it just was very inefficient, all the rest of it. It's not all that much better today, but it's, it's, it's evolved. Um, but what I would say is, is like, I, I was like, there needs to be a book around this, right? Like there needs to be best practices. And what I figured out was, I started by interviewing a whole bunch of people. I think I interviewed like 50 people that had acquired companies, right? And it was one of these things where every time I would ask them a question, they would say things like, oh, well, you know, like, I'd be like, what do you, what kind of business are you looking for? And they're like, oh, I was just looking for the same thing everybody else is looking for. I was looking for, and then they would say something completely different, right? And so everyone had these different things and it was very like, every situation was very anecdotal, right? And, and like, there was no best practice. And so I started realizing, okay, wait a minute, maybe instead of creating like a, a, a guide of best practices, maybe what this really needs is sort of like frameworks, okay? And so when I started talking to brokers, okay, especially for myself, they always said, okay, what's your background? You know, what, you know, what, what, what kind of thing have you, have you done in the past? And let me just apply that to what I think you're, you wanna buy, right? And then typically what would happen, Adam, is that they would then start sending me all these things that looked like the industry I had come from which was not at all what I was looking for, right? Like what I was looking for was the opportunity that I could impact, okay? And I didn't care if it was, I really didn't care if it was manufacturing or distribution, even a service company, right? What I wanted was an opportunity 
that, that I could leverage my skill set and grow the business. That's what I wanted, a culture that matched me. So it's all of these soft things that actually identify the target. And so I, I, I ended up wasting a lot of broker's time because they thought I wanted something that looked like I just come from, okay? And they were defining it by industry and maybe even size, which I was like, why are you, like, I can get the money if like, you know, you know, and, 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 and so I felt like it wasn't quite there. And so what I realized was, wait a minute, when you are looking for a business to buy, okay, when you're a searcher, you are a CEO already. And your first job is to find the company that you are supposed to lead, okay? And so when you are looking for that opportunity, it's all about what do I bring to the table? And you gotta start with you because otherwise it's like that Alice in Wonderland, like, where are you going? Oh, I don't know. Well, then it doesn't much matter which way you go, does it, right? So it's all about, do you have the aptitude to be an entrepreneur? Do you have the mindset, right? Or attitude to be an entrepreneur? What, you know, what, what's your skill set? And the big thing, Adam, I would say is, um, is the, the, the activities that you want to be doing every day, right? So um, just as, as an extreme example, I used to race road bikes, okay? And I considered like buying a bike shop or whatever at one point. And I was like, you know, the difference between riding a bike, you know, out in like Chesterfield, Missouri, in the rolling hills, like on the weekends, and being in the bike shop repairing everybody else's bike on the weekends is such a different right <laughs> right so so the thing is is you have to be like hey i like this business but what am i actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis right and um you know if you are one of those people that's okay being in a business park with one restaurant that's like a mcdonald's connected to a gas station know that that's what you're signing up for right whereas you know if you require you know i don't know a, um a remote sort of uh, um, uh, environment in order to, to thrive, that, you know, you, you got to take these things into account how you're spending your time. So let's let's follow up on that. You, you've sort of done a you know attitude and sort of personal SWOT analysis. You're figuring out where you're strong, where you're weak, what kind of business, what industry. I get all that. Um, you've done that done that work. Then, then okay, I got to get the money. So, so, oh, sure. So I need to, I, you know, how, I, t tell me what, what, you know, I, how do I go and get pre-qualified? Tell me who I should talk to about, you know, determining my budget, what, what I can afford, what do I need? Just sort of all those personal finance questions, which are very, very relevant for every, okay. everyone looking for business. Right. Adam, great. Okay, great. First of all, I would I, like, I learned in, I learned in business school, the answer to every business question is it depends. Right. Okay. So, so, you know, I mean, there's sort of like a decision tree here, but let me just sort of directionally um, get after this. What I would say is, is, you know, don't forget that, you know, 4% of companies in the United States are greater than a million dollars in revenue. Okay. And the SBA as of 2000, January 1st, 2016 came out with, listen, you can put 10% down some, most of the time. Okay. Um, and um, uh, as little as 10% down is the way to say it. Um, and uh, we don't care if there's any collateral, okay? Sidebar, first company I ever bought was a book printing company. And one of the three main reasons was because it had a whole lot of collateral. So the bank was like, sure, we'll fund that. Right. right. Okay? That, was an, that was an $8 million revenue business, right? Like it, it, was, it was significant, but because it had collateral, I could buy it. Today, you, you can buy, you know, a website that just, does, just has a little cash flow coming in, okay? And so the concept is, is that, you know, you can buy a company doing a million dollars in revenue with comfortably less than, let's just say $200,000 in your bank account, okay? So, um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the concept is, is that when you're buying companies between one and $5 million in transactional value, okay, the single best source of funding today that I have found is through the Small Business Administration loans, okay? Right. Um, it, yeah, and, and they're, they are, um, uh, a separate entity within the government that is actually sustainable and profitable on their own, okay? Which is great. Um, it does take a while. It's sort of like getting a bank loan from the post office. Like it's a government institution, right? And there's like just, you know, like checking boxes and doing all the things. And by the way, you're not getting a loan from the SBA, you're getting it from a lender and the SBA is acting as your collateral, really, okay, is what's going on. 
So what you want to do is step one, you know, get your, get your uh, personal financial statement or personal balance sheet, you know, polished up so that you have a sense of, you can communicate effectively what your financial situation is. Step two is, you know, probably dust off that resume and tune it up so that you can, you know, present yourself for a loan. Um, and number three, I'm sorry, I don't mean this to be a pitch, but go read, buy, then build, figure out your target statement so you can communicate to a bank what you're looking for, okay? <laughs> and, then, um, and then say, hey, I'm trying to get pre-qualified so that when I go in and talk to Adam and say, hey, look, you know, I'm looking for a business, Adam, and uh, here's my resume, here's my PFS, and here's my... Um, Here's my, you know, uh, pre-qualification letter from the SBA. In fact, if you have that pre-qual letter, I probably don't even need to show you my personal right. financial statements. That's all you care about. Do I have access to the money to close on something, right? And you can borrow up to $5 million um, from the SBA. Yeah, what do you think, Adam? Did that, did that cover it? Is there something? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's amazing to me how many people, um, well, we talk to, they say, well, I'm not prepared to share my personal financial statement or I'm... I haven't gotten out. to be qualified. And, You're and out. That, that, we tell them that too. Um, no. it, it's, you know, that's just how it works. Um, it, 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 no one makes money talking to buyers with no money. And correct. so the first thing you have to do is say like, hey, you're about to show me a whole bunch of confidential information. And so I need to show you that I'm capable, if I make a decision to move forward on this, I am capable to actually execute. That's what you need to communicate, frankly, in your first in your first call with a broker, right? Or even in your first email, like that's the thing, because that's the thing that moves you forward. Like, I mean, Adam, I don't know how you are, but I feel like if, here's the thing, doing outreach to, to business brokers, okay, is the single fastest way to increase deal flow, period, okay? Even if you are stuck on this idea of, of not using a broker and like doing a deal outside, okay? The thing is, is that when you own a business, okay, it will be just statistically the single most valuable thing that you own and 50% of the financial reward is gonna come on the day that you sell, okay? So if you have any, any whim of preparation in order to exit the most valuable thing of your life, you're probably gonna be talking with someone who can take you to market that understands how to get the, the darn thing closed, right? And how to value it, how to structure these things and how to get it closed. And every single time that I end up talking to even traditional search funds, um, they'll say like, well, I started with brokers. I spent, I then spent, you know, 95% of my time looking for off market deals. And then I, I ended up buying a business through a broker. Get the deal from the brokers, right? Fill your inbox. And all you want to do is reach out to Adam, reach out to Quiet Light, which is the firm I work with. And then, you know, all the brokers in your area, all the ones looking for, you know, whatever, and say, listen, I'm SBA pre-qualified. I'm ready to go. I'm looking for a deal. I'm ready. I'm, I have conviction. I want to close in the next six months. Boom. Even if you're just saying these things, you're getting on our email list because we know you're for real. And we're going to start filling your inbox as these deals come in and it'll give you something to work on, right? Correct. Right. There's kind yeah. of an academic exercise to like just looking at deals and like getting comfortable with like, do I like this or not? Yeah, Sorry. what I what I no, you're hundred percent right. What I have to tell what I have to tell buyers is this is not like going into Walmart and going down aisle six and just pulling off, you know, milk and going to pay for it. Like this is a bit of a treasure hunt. And if you came in and said, Hey, I want to buy an HVAC business, you know we may come up with two or three or four and you may reject all of them. So you have to be a little open-minded to what you want. Um, but, but let's, let's talk sort of a little bit about search. You talked about the best value of your time is, is talking yeah. with brokers, um, obviously getting pre-qualified with SBA lenders, who else should searchers, buyers of businesses be talking to and who should they not be talking to? Adam, I want your answer on this question. Well, I'll tell you who they should be talking to before they come to my office or your office. And that nice. is they should be talking to uh, either their spouse or their partner or their significant other. I cannot tell you, um, we, we, we have sort of a rule here and it applies to both buyers and to sellers. We don't ever take a business to market from a seller perspective without a spousal consent form. Wow. And when a buyer is going to go buy a two, three, four, five million dollar business, we want to know that their spouse understands potentially that their house is going to be collateralized by the lender. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's amazing when we bring that up in the first conversation, they're like, nah, I don't think they're going to go for that. Well, I politely say then, you know, this is, this might not be for you because any bank is going to look for some collateral, particularly when you're buying an assetless business. Mm -hmm. So I always say we want to, we want to meet with the spouse, significant other partner, whatever, whatever, who that person is in your life. Um, because you know, in, in addition to having money, having that support is vital or we're all wasting our time. I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I, you know, the, the other thing I would say is, is um, a lot of even the hesitation that I had uh, in, you know, back in 2004 to 2006, like it took me two years to find my first acquisition. Okay. The last three companies I acquired just for comparison, it, I saw the the sim on Thursday or Friday, and I was under LOI at full asking price on Monday. I mean, you, you just you start to get like a a, a, a clear yeah. sense of what you're after, right? Yeah. And and the thing is, is like, in order to succeed, okay, you have to do things that prepare you and allow you to commit, right, to to this to this adventure. And I think one of the things you're, you're touching on is a critical thing, which is like this this is a joint venture with your spouse. Um, the other thing I would do is like, you just really have to understand the business model, right? Because a lot of times people are kind of spinning in terms of like, okay, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And it's because they don't have the tools to sort of feel comfortable. Right. And a lot of times whenever I see a, a buyer get cold feet, right. And I'm talking like at the altar, like, I don't know, like like, I just don't feel comfortable or whatever, okay? If you actually do the math on interest rates, hint, it actually doesn't matter, okay? It really doesn't, okay? I mean, sure, small impact, but you're buying a cash flowing entity, okay? The, the thing is, is these types of things are not important and should not throw you off balance, right? Um, I mean, you know, with, you know if, I mean, yes, if we end up at, you know, 20% interest rates, like hit pump the brakes, but, but, but I mean, like these things don't matter. And the thing is, is usually it's because people, they didn't do enough diligence, and so they're not comfortable, right? And even before that, I feel like people will end up spending six to 12 months just looking at things, trying to put the pieces together so that the whole business model actually makes sense in their head, right? And so, you know, um, you know again, like any kind of educational uh, program, uh, like, like Buy Then Build or, you know, our free resources, I'm sure VR has free resources. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta understand what it is you're getting into so that you're comfortable to execute. Yeah, I just want to touch, uh, I want to repeat something you said, because I think everyone watching this heard the second part of your sentence when you said, I bought three businesses on a Friday, saw them on Friday and had a full price offer on Monday. Yeah. The first part of that sentence was, it took me two years to buy my first business. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I always tell people is this is a marathon, not a sprint. If you're in this telling me coming in and say, oh, I have to have a business by the end of Q1. Good luck. You're not going to make the right decisions. You're not going to do the, the analysis that's required. Um, so speaking of analysis, one of the things that I always find, you know, the, the under the SBA eligible businesses, they, they have a different terminology, you know, SDE and, you know, um, adjusted EBITDA and, and understanding what true cash flow is and depreciation, amortization. A lot of people have some what I would say, working knowledge of, of, of financials, but you get into small business and small business language from an analysis standpoint, what, what are some things that you like to always bring up to people? Because it is different. And when I get the corporate executive coming in here, looking at things, they don't understand, well, why are you adding back one owner's salary? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just don't understand some of these concepts. So talk a little bit about some of the financial terminology that the buyers yeah. need to be aware of. Yeah, I, quick side note, I wanna I want to share that, um, so I have this program, the Acquisition Lab, okay? And we, we actually, um, it's it's not easy to get into is what I'll say. We have a, a, about a 25% acceptance rate, okay? If we don't feel like you're actually capable of being a CEO or a business owner, you can't get in or whatever. Um, so it's a really great group of people. But the thing is, is that like we go through, you know, it starts with this one month intensive and then we roll people into the search, okay? And, um, it just gets everyone on the same page in terms of terminology and all the rest of it. And we've had, we've had about 
350 people go through the program so far. We've just closed about 100 million in transactions, by the way, in, in the last 18 months. It's been really cool. But um, about 5% uh, of our membership base ends up being brokers. And it's because of this topic. And what happens is, is they end up interacting with brokers. And then the brokers say like, like they'll come back to the lab and be like, I understand this industry, be this space better than the brokers do. Right. <laughs> and we go deep into this subject. But what I would start by saying is there is a difference between EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA and SDE. OK. And most people do not understand it. OK. Um, what I would. OK. Let me let me let me let me let me say this and then I'll come back and answer your question more directly. But I was talking with um, you may or may not know Cody Sanchez. I was I was in a bar with Cody Sanchez last week and she was like, hey, like I'm getting like I get a lot of questions from buyers around like you know, like how to run analysis and all this stuff. Like, like, what do you do? Are you doing like, you know, net present value, discounted cash flow models and like, you know, three, three statement financial forecasts and like all this stuff. And I was like, no, I really don't. I, I literally, like, I look at the PL, I figure out, you know, what, what SDE is. And then I, I subtract, um, uh, you know, principal and interest payments. And like, I sort of like look at how it's been growing or not. And I kind of go, okay, like that, like, because you don't know what, tr what reality is, right? It's going to be yours tomorrow, okay? I can't look at the past and know what I'm going to do, okay? I know about what it is. I understand the infrastructure. You got to look at the risks and be like, am I comfortable with the risks? Am I comfortable with the growth opportunity? Can I bring value? And then move, right? Go. That's, that's what you're going to do as a small business owner. You're not going to sit around doing, you know, you, you know, you don't have anyone on staff doing a lot of, you know, financial engineering and things like this. It's hustle, right? <laughs> um, so what I would say to that is EBITDA, just to, you know, I, I could spend a lot, I don't want to. EBITDA is how we judge publicly traded companies. And I think that most people understand that and they understand the word, okay? And, and there's a great history behind it, but um, it's too long to, to go into here. But the thing is, is that like, it's basically how do we look at this company and that company and look at their earnings and adjust for management decisions, okay? And that's EBITDA, okay? Then when you look at the private capital market, even the same size, like 50 to 250 million or above, you start looking at adjusted EBITDA, which is sort of like a, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like a, like a remote owner sort of a thing. In other words, there's a management team included in an adjusted EBITDA number, okay? But you're still doing all the ad backs that you don't get in an EBITDA, okay? Then you have SDE. SDE is how, is the, is the, um, the unit of measure for earnings for, I would say, any small business, um, you know, I, comfortably below 25 million, most of the time you're looking at an SDE number, okay? And SDE is basically, if I am the owner of this black box, okay? then it is assumed that I'm operating it, okay? And if I choose to not work on it and fill in a management team, I'm burning my own SDE number, but that's my choice as the owner of this black box. In other words, what is the total cash flow to the owner of this black box that they can make discretionary decisions about reinvestment, principal and interest, additional management team, growth investments, et cetera? Yeah, people are always amazed. You, you summarize that well. People are always amazed when I hand them a two-page definition of what is SDE. The International Business Brokers Association has a definition that brokers like Walker and myself and, and many other really good brokers across the country, we follow. I mean, it's just like accountants have rules. Uh, we follow rules as well on how, so that way, a business that I'm looking at would be valued the same way by Walker or, or other brokers um, throughout the country. Well, and a, and a note on that, you and I are very respectable individuals that are educated in the space. Uh, the, thing, the, the thing with interacting with brokers is that, um, Adam, you, you might you know, smack me in the face when this is over, but I, I feel like most brokers out there hmm, are terrible, okay? It's, there's, not a, there's not any kind of licensing or certification that anyone needs in most states to become a business broker. And the ones that do just say like, I don't know, they need some uh, real estate license, okay? This is a completely unregulated market. And if anyone can understand, like what if anyone you knew could just become a real estate agent without any kind of licensing, any kind of regulation, any kind of anything, and they just decide like, hey, I'm a real estate agent. They just decided that day. Right. And then they go out and they try to do it. Right. So that they anyone looking for a business will interact 
with brokers like that, okay? And a lot of them don't do a lot of work. They just fling a bunch of stuff out there, okay? It's not organized. And what I would say is, is that on this topic of SDE, um, when you do get um, a, a, a situ when, you're, when you do find a situation that um, might have a little padding, okay? It's usually in the ad backs. So they're correct to ask about it, okay? However, ad backs, ad backs are what get you from net income to seller's discretionary earnings or SDE. And it's in there that those things need to be black or white, okay? It's one-time expenses. It's discretionary seller, you know, um, in income or benefits. It's, it's not, you know, there, there shouldn't be any gray things in there that's like, well, that's debatable. Like, that's not, that's not what SDE is. And Walker, so, so. it has to actually be on the, it actually has to be on the P&L. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Good point. Yeah, that's right. You can't just add back cash that was on the side. Yeah, yeah. that happened. Or sellers say, oh, I spent 30000 I went to Europe last year. Okay, where is that on the P&L? <laughs> I, I, I spent the, well it's not on the pnl right? yeah so right. just a quick a, a quick comment to that walker i, I happen to agree I, I think it's part of the reason i got in this business i saw an opportunity to be a professional ethical business broker that's really focused on education uh full disclosure full disclosure walker and i met through continuing education in this industry i mean we both walk the walk we believe on getting all those extra letters in behind your name because education matters we can provide the best experience and and product and service to our clients and and so you know that that's part of the reason why you know what walker's doing is so good not just for him but it's it's good for the industry it's good for people like me and it's good for people who are watching this who want to who want to buy a business so let's sort of segue here and i just i want to make a, one announcement um we are we are cruising here. There is zero chance we're going to be done uh, in 15 more minutes. Okay. So we may, go, we may go a little long today. But also, um, I forgot to let you know. If you want to put something into the the chat or the or the Q and A, um, I'll do my best to integrate it. Uh, we got we got a fair amount of people on here, so uh, we want to make sure that you feel like you're being involved in this in this uh, discussion, which you may or may not be. But I want to at least make you feel like you are. So Walker. We have done the search. We've hopefully talked with brokers. We've talked maybe privately with attorneys and financial advisors and other people may find an off market, but eventually they may come back to a broker, et cetera. Now we're, we've done the analysis and now we're, we're, we're having that sort of buyer seller meeting and okay. you got to be able to convince the seller that you're the right person to take on their baby. And so talk through that whole process. Yeah, so, so it, it, look, I, I think that, you know, when I, when I was, ra when I raised capital, I'll say it present tense, um, there's a certain entrepreneur investor dynamic that goes like this. You know, I come in and, you know, I, I show you my pitch deck and, you know, I'm showing you like, hey, here's the opportunity. Here's the thing that we're doing. Here's why we're the right people to execute. Here's why it's going to work and how much money it's going to be worth in the future. And like today, if you invest, then you can get in at this valuation. And like, by the way, um, it's soft committed. So like if you could kind of hurry up, that'd be great because I think I can get you in real quick. Right. It's this it's this kind of like and, and when you're the investor, you kind of have to sit back, you know, with, with kind of a critical, you know, um, with, with sort of a critical approach to what you're getting pitched, okay? Because most of these startup companies aren't going to make it, right? And you have to sort of say, like, do I believe that this team can execute? Do I believe that this opportunity uh, is worth pursuing? Do I believe that this product solves a real problem, okay? And it is the, um, the cautious investor that is successful, okay? What I saw when I first started getting into the business buying uh, world was that um, most of the buyers were going in with a with an investor mindset, okay? And um, they were sort of treating it the same way as if like they were kind of expecting the seller to kind of come in and do a dog and pony show and can and pitch them on like why they should be buying the business, okay? And you and I both know it's quite the opposite. <laughs> the seller is sitting on usually a cash flowing machine 
Okay, usually something that, you know, they've put in a lot of time to, whether that be as little as like four years or as many as 35, okay, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's put probably all their kids through college, right? And uh, it's just a cash machine and they run a business and like, uh, can I cuss on this? Sure. They don't give a shit if you buy it or not, right? I mean, even if they want to exit, right? It's sort of like, I don't care. Like, I need the right person, okay? Like, like right. if there's not the right person, it's sort of like going on a date. It's like, yeah, I might really want a date, but like, it's got to be the right person, right? You can't just like throw me any, you know? So it's like, it's quite the opposite. And, and you know, when you go in, look, I, I mean, you need it to be genuine, Okay, but what I learned when I was going through it was, and I bought companies actively for 10 years in many different industries and all, all the rest of it. What I learned was the first thing I would do is I would walk in and I would just praise them on what they built. Like it was like, what you have done here is like totally incredible. Okay, because it is. They've created something from nothing. And anyone who's tried to do it knows it's completely impossible to succeed at that. Like, you know, it's just really hard. And so to, to get something that's viable, that's successful, that has all of these things is, it, it, you know, first of, you know, it's just, it, it's incredible that they did it. And so rather than going in and being like, okay, pitch, it's sort of like, wow, you've like really succeeded here. Then it really needs to go into selling the seller on why you're the right buyer. Again, please be genuine. Don't like use, this is like the force, like don't use it for the dark side to like manipulate, but it's sort of like, Hey, this is what I bring to the table. This is what I like about your business. Like this is this, you know, you, you, you know, don't crush them with your like, you know, vision of the future on hello, but, it, but it's sort of like, you, you need to really be engaged and the best buyers, they kind of emit a, you know, confidence and speed to closing. Like, it's like, I like this, you know, assuming it match, assuming everything is presented to me is true. I'm, I'm ready to move forward. You know, when I decide I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a go or no go decision quickly. And then once we get into diligence, like, trust me, when I make you an offer, I just want to get it closed. And I'm not saying don't do diligence. I'm just saying you need to say, like, if I make this decision, I really am going to close. And by the way, I want you to think that I'm the, I'm the right guy to do this. And I really want to carry your torch and your legacy and do you justice once it's mine. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would just uh, add to that. And I know this is probably a common mistake and we can touch on this in the end, but in that first meeting, when you're meeting with a potential seller, don't say, I'm really looking forward to meeting with your employees right after the letter of intent. Um, that will uh, have your letter of intent rejected immediately. Um, it, there, there's a time and a place, and uh, at a first meeting is not the time to be digging into employees. Trust me, it's yeah. the it's the quickest way to get get thrown out, regardless of what your offer is. I, I mean, you can't ask like you know sort of who's doing what, what's the management structure, like whatever. I mean, like like yes. you know, if you're strong in sales and marketing, you might really want an operations person in place. And if you yes. if it comes in and it turns out the seller is the operations person and they're leaving, of you course, so that you know, yeah. But right to your point. Yeah. No, so no. we've had a, we've had a buyer seller meeting and and we're you know going to make an offer. Um, let's talk a little bit about you know some of the the alphabet soup an LOI and APA. You know what people should be including and not including. You know getting into DD due diligence. Um, what they're you know what buyers are buyers have rights to a lot of things, but not everything, and not everything when they want it. I, I always like to tell buyers, you need to earn the right to see more information. We're not giving you, you can give me a 17 page due diligence list, but I'm not giving you the employee data until we have Later. your commitment letter and further yeah. on. Et cetera. So let's just sort of talk about making the offer and getting through due diligence and then ultimately getting to closing. Sure. So, um, okay. Number one, um, I, I think that uh, um, pre LOI letter of intent, your offer. Okay. Um, and some people use an IOI and all this other stuff. Let's just use yep. I, LOI. Okay. Yep. Um, most common. So, so pre LOI, what I want buyers to do and what I recommend they all do is basically ask any question you need to get to a go or no go decision. Okay. And understand that you're not in diligence. Okay. Um, th this is, um, how am I trying to explain it? Like, like, like there's, you have to, you're at the point where you need to assume everything being communicated to you is true. Okay. 
And one of the things that, you know, Adam, you and I get a lot is the, the, the buyer that never makes an offer is the one that keeps asking for a bunch of spreadsheets on a whole bunch of detail around stuff. Okay. It's like, look, if you're drilling down into this detail, like, where are you on the decision? And it's like, oh, I need to know how many times Walker goes pee between eight and 5 PM before I, it's like, what are you talking about? Like, it just, it has nothing to do with the business or what, or whether you want it or not. Like, it's just like so in, unimportant. And so the thing is, is like, you need to ask whatever it is you need to make a go or no go decision, make it as shallow as possible and make your offer. Okay. Now, what should that offer be? Okay. There's price, there's terms, there's all this stuff. All I'm, all I'm going to say on that on this call is listen, a lot of times buyers will come to me and say, Hey, Walker, what do you think I should offer on this business? And I'll say, well, is there an asking price? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, it says 1.5 million right here. And I'll say, well, they're telling you what they want. How do you feel about 1.5 million? Okay. And a lot of times when you look at it, you know, if it's, if it's a, if it's a, you know, a 3.2 times seller's discretionary earnings, or it's a 3.7 times seller's discretionary earnings, I just want all the buyers to understand you're arguing over six months of earnings. Okay. It's important. It's important. And you need to address the risks that you're taking on in the structure of the deal. Okay. But you know, I think that you, you really don't want to get in your own way. And a lot of times I will just offer full price because I want the asset. I like the asset. It's worth it. Um, and I, I don't, I typically don't spend a whole lot of time haggling over this or that. I mean, you know, if it's 0.1 times SDE, who cares? Okay. Pay it and move on. It's going to be a 10 year loan. Okay. It's spread over 10 years. Like, you know, so, so, you know, it's, it, it's usually not the purchase price. Usually not. Now it can be. Um, um, so then once you make your LOI, you want me to go through the things that are in it? Yeah, absolutely. Go I for mean, it. you know, it's basically like what, you know, what's the purchase price you're offering? You know, what are the terms of the deal? Meaning is it cash at close? You know, is it, is it some kind of de deferred structure? Um, uh, contingencies to closing, the closing yeah. date, the closing date. And by the way, most sellers don't know this, but the closing date on the LOI is never accurate. Okay. But what it communicates to Adam and I is what's the intention of the buyer here? Like, is this like a 90 day? Are they asking for like four months? Are they like, you know, I'm going to close in, in 45 days, as long as the bank will help me get that done. It, it tells us where you are, right? It's a roadmap. Um, yeah, it's a roadmap. Yeah. And then um, the last thing that's coming to mind and is, is um, the exclusivity period, right? And so the, 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 the only thing that's binding in a letter of intent is the exclusivity period. And what that means is that the seller is basically getting engaged to you to get married and they can no longer go on dates with anyone else. And what that does to you as the buyer is say, great, we now have this offer. It's more than a verbal, it's in writing. I want what you have and I'm gonna pay this many dollars on these terms, okay? Now with my exclusivity, you've now given me permission to go spend money on money and time on diligence. And that could be just me, it could be a diligence firm, it could be an accountant, it could be what, you know, whatever you decide needs to be a part, lawyers, obviously. Um, I'll pause there. Anything you want to add about the LOI? No, no. I mean, I think this is great. I, I think, I think, um, you know, some people get so they want to do their pre diligence, their due diligence pre LOI, no. and you know, yeah, it doesn't here's, work. Here's how I think about diligence. Okay, now, I mean, please, like, I want this to be constructive. I don't. I'm, you know, I'm one guy making it up. But like, the thing is, is like, I view diligence as like this. It's, it's basically. Um, there's three things that need to happen. Financial due diligence, legal due diligence, and operational due diligence, okay? Right. And the thing is, is that everybody wants the buyer, you too, as the buyer, and you don't realize it, okay? What you wanna do is financial due diligence first, okay? Because if you spend 60 plus days under contract with a, with a seller, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, geez, I'm just looking at the P&L and like, I don't agree with any of this stuff. You've literally just wasted everybody's time and, and including like forcing the seller to take their eye off the ball and, and potentially injuring their
their ability to, to move forward with, with the sale of their business. Okay, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Um, don't do that. Respect who you are in, in, in work on your team. You got to respect your team and who you're working with here. Um, so do your financial due diligence. Um, depending on the type of business it is, you got to knock it out in like one to four weeks. Okay. Number two, um, legal due diligence. Most attorneys, it, what is legal due diligence? It's basically, yes, it is looking at contracts. Okay. But it's basically like, is this a real entity? Have they ever been sued? Like, you know, let me look at the operating agreement. You know, it's just like this, those sort of things. Are they being sued right now? Right? Like, who are these people? Some people might include a background check on a seller, right? But the, but the thing is, is like legal due diligence, in my experience, you know, my attorney can do that in like five days. Like it just happens in the background. You get financial diligence done. And as you start moving to more and more confidence, okay, if I could magically drop an asset purchase agreement right on the day where everyone's giving a thumbs up on financial due diligence, you've got financial due diligence done, you've got legal due diligence done, here comes the asset purchase agreement that in my opinion, the buyer is submitting to the seller. It can go both ways, but it's the buyer's offer. And not only that, but if the seller makes it, if the seller's attorney makes it and sends it to the buyer, the buyer's attorney is gonna put in all the reps and warranties, and all the indemnifications that the seller's attorney is not going to put in. And so just on the first lap, it looks like a bloodbath. Okay. So it's just better if the buyer submits the, the asset purchase agreement. And this is assuming an asset sale. If you're doing a stock sale, it'd be an SPA stock purchase agreement, but whatever. So, so, um, uh, you know, and that, that of course is going to be the legal binding document that will ultimately execute the deal while the APA is being negotiated back and forth with the attorneys. And I say negotiated only because I've never seen an attorney say, looks good, looks That's good, right, no right. comments. Yeah, no comments, just close, right? I've never seen that. There's always negotiating. But, but the thing is, is, and by the way, when the APA is coming in and the financial due diligence is completed, I want the buyer to say like, everything that was represented was true. I'm good to go. Or everything that was represented was not true. And we need to look at this together, okay? Because this, this is wrong and we need to make adjustments, okay? That's the time to be making adjustments, not at the end, okay? Because, yeah. oh man, you're going to piss everyone off. But, but, the, right. but I mean, some, some buyers, you know, they want to be Donald Trump style negotiators or whatever, fine, okay? But you're wasting a lot of time. So, so um, then while the APA is going, that's when you get into operational due diligence, okay? Everyone's comfortable with you. Right, maybe the buyer and seller and the broker have been have been talking weekly. Okay, financial diligence is done, legal diligence is done. Usually, the the SBA has approved the loan. Right, like a lot of those things. Now it's time to get into like, okay, hey Adam, how is this sausage made exactly? Okay, right. it's like good. So now you start to get into, all right, you know, you know, maybe some some other components of it. Um, but to your point. During operational diligence, it's not until the very end where the real most sensitive stuff, you know, um, is 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 sort of allowed, right? So let me give, can I give you an example? Sure. I bought a company um, with uh, what you know. I always use Porter's Five Forces to evaluate. And I, you know, people like MBA graduates are like, you don't actually use Porter's Five Forces. I'm like, no, I do. I use it all the time, right? You know? <laughs> and this business had a very strong supplier power. Okay. In other words, there was one place to get the product. And if that relationship didn't transfer that's or right. at some later date, you know, they didn't work with me. That's, that's an issue. Um, I didn't know I bought another company with customer concentration. Like, I mean, and I'm talking like 25% of the business was a customer. Okay. Um, in the supplier power situation, I had a call with the supplier after the APA was all verbally agreed to, and we were closing the next day. And all it was, was like, hey, nice to meet you. Go back to, the, I'm meeting the seller. I'm Walker, here's what I bring to the table. I'm really excited about doing this, like blah, blah, blah. And I just need to know, you know, is this partnership solid, right? And I'll leave, you know, I think I even said something like, I'm making the largest financial investment of my entire life. And like, if this doesn't work out, like it's detrimental. So like, I just sort of need to know, right? That like, we're good. And because I think that this company is bringing tremendous value to you, don't you, right? You know, and, and you know, right. yes, it was a great call. We closed, you know, it's, that was seven years ago. Talked to the guy again yesterday. Like we're just, we continue to thrive. 
yeah. on the one with the so customer power, I didn't talk to the customer before closing. Why? Because it's a customer. If you talk to a customer before closing and then you don't close, it's an asymmetrical risk that no seller can take on. You will destroy the company and everything that the seller has built. Okay. In either case, I met that, that customer that it wasn't the day after closing, but we called them the day after closing and said, this happened. Let's set up a meeting, right? First thing I do is always call customers. So a supplier day before closing customer day after closing, right? The most sensitive kind of stuff. Okay. Right. Usually I don't meet any employees until after closing. Is that true? Yeah. I've never met an employee pre-closing. Is that true? Look, I, I mean, I've, I've participated. We, in almost ra we rarely allow it. It's, it's, ra it's, ra it's, not, it's just, ra it, it, it's got to be a really compelling reason. Um, let me sort of take a step back here. So we've sort of tactically talked about, you know, starting versus buying. We've talked about doing the research, talking with brokers. We've talked about getting pre-qualified. We've talked about analysis, searching for businesses. We've talked about writing a letter of intent. We've talked about, um, you know, APA and due diligence and all these things to get it closed. And, and these are all routine process driven things. I want to sort of introduce something here that uh, many buyers and sellers, quite frankly, aren't prepared for, which is, you know, these don't always work. There's ups and downs. These deals die three times. There's an emotional stress that goes on that if you think the first business or two you're going to look at, you're going to buy. I mean, yes. Does it happen one out of a hundred times? Yes. But this is a real emotional journey. And so, you know, last month on our webinar, we had a psychologist on just to talk about it. I got so much positive feedback from buyers and sellers and, and advisors because no one talks about this. Let's, so let's just take a minute here because you see it, Walker, on your deals, both ones you've done and ones that you broker. We, we see it as well. It's a journey, emotional. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, the biggest thing I would say to that is, I mean, this is the headline. Okay. The deal's never done until it's done and do not ever, ever, ever put any real weight on the closing date. You know, when, when I see people, you know, talking with, you know, swimming pool installers, you know, three weeks before closing, it's like, no, <laughs> no, don't go there in your head. Okay. Um, what? But how yeah. do you explain that, Walker? Let me focus on. How do you explain that to a buyer? And we're talking to many sure. buyers right now, who says, "Well, I have to talk to the employees, or I have to meet the customers." And and you and I know that's just not how it's done. There's that's yeah. too much of the goodwill and the risk for the seller. How do yeah. you have that conversation with the buyer? Say, "There's a time and a place, and this is not the time nor the place." Yeah. Well, I mean, I start. I start with usually how I outline diligence as I just did. Right. And, th and then I just, I simply talk about, imagine if it's your business. Okay. Like, like the damage, the damage that can be done is you, you can't fix it. The damage that can be done, you can't fix. And the thing is, is what I want you to do is look at this thing that you're buying. Right. And again, revenue, infrastructure, earnings, been running for a number of years. Here's all the stuff. Okay. Then you should also be comfortable because you've got, you know, reps and warranties and indemnifications in the, in the um, asset purchase agreement. So if that seller is lying to you, like that's like, you can take legal action, right? I mean, you know, I mean, it, like it's, it's not, there's nothing light to be taken lightly here. Right. And um, one of the things that I do always ask is like, have you made any promises to any employees about raises or bonuses or anything like that? Right. Because every single business I've ever bought within the first four weeks, everyone asked me for a raise or they tell me the seller promised me this bonus or like it always happens. Right. <laughs> and I look them right in the face. and I'm like, I very specifically asked, you know, Anne this question before she sold me the company and like, you know, because it's very important to me. And so, you know, whatever. And so I, I always diffuse it that way. Um, bit of a tangent. But it's an emotional journey. I mean, it's, just, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't even know what else to add to that other than. I, 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 my whole point is I bring it up because I think people be, need to be aware. Like this isn't, like, yeah. I have my buy then build book here. Okay. You can read yeah. what's in here, but mm -hmm. you have to be prepared for what's going to go on up here. Because yeah. it's, 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 it's unique. Yeah. And I, I think. And more so for the seller too. 
the, the amount of risk that you're taking on when you buy, I mean, like the first few businesses that I bought, first few, yeah, the first like probably two or three I bought, like I just wanted to throw up on closing day. It was like, oh my God. Like it was like, and, and a lot of times people, they think they're going to buy a business and they're like, oh man, this thing is like kicking off a million bucks. First thing I'm going to do is increase my salary to owner status. And it's like, no, build cash, build safety, understand what the heck is going on. Like, I want you to think, really approach it as a bootstrap kind of situation. Okay. okay? Yeah. And um, yeah, and I think it, you know, I mean, Adam, I guess it goes all the way back to my sort of prep funnel and to just the attitude, aptitude and action first thing, because, because that's the thing that's going to get you across the finish line. Um, yeah. I feel like, you know, buyers get really emotional, like right towards the end, but, um, and, they, and they start to, you know, my colleague Jason came up with this thing called the 11th hour freak out is what he calls it. And it's basically like a buyer calls like two days before closing and they just say something right. And like, whatever it is. And, and like, you have to look at it and it's, this is maybe one of the hardest parts of being a broker is you have to, like, I always, when I get the call, I'm like, I'm expecting it. I'm like, here it comes. And I'm like, what's up? And I listen to them very closely and I'm like, all right, hold on. Let me think about this. And I just take a breath and I think to myself, are they telling me something that is actually like a, a, a problem with the business or are they just kind of freaking out because they're about to buy a company? And I'm telling you nine out of 10 times, it's this one, right? And as the broker, you're sort of the, the rational person that's able to see the whole deal, okay? Yeah. And, um, and hopefully by that time, you've, you've built a partnership with the buyer because you're all, here's how I think about it, Adam, is that when, when, we go to, when, 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 when we're talking to a, a seller before we go to market, we represent the market. When we go to market with the, with the business, we represent the seller. Once the buyer and seller, you know, are trying to get to a common goal. Okay. At the end of the day, you and I don't care like what, how, how the economics shift, like, like, yes, we have a fiduciary responsibility to the seller. Okay. But the thing is, is like, we're a team, man. And like, we just, you know, you guys want to do this thing. I'm on board. I'm going to coordinate it. And the truth, the truth, Adam, I've never once closed a deal without a broker involved ever. And it's because the seller or the buyer through negotiations, they got to step away from the table. There's no one to coordinate. There's a bunch of lawyers involved. Look, I love lawyers. Not really, but you know what I'm saying? Like they don't always play nice. And then when you get to the end and the buyer's freaking out or whatever, the seller just is exploding. So it's like, I can't control you. Right. And, and it's like, like what, like so many sellers, like once you get in this seat, you're just going to know, like you just understand, like there's just a flow of the business yep. and you're asking me all these spreadsheet questions. And it's like, I don't know, I've been doing this 20 years. I do that in five minutes. And I, I look at my, I look at my cash balance and I know exactly, I can look at my cash balance in my bank and I know exactly how much inventory I have. Right. You're, you're, I mean, you know, like you're not, like, I don't have a spreadsheet. I already know. <laughs> and like, how do you extract that? Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was a bit of a ramble, but no. Uh, hey, well, I want to. I want to keep it moving here. Before we quote close the deal, we had a question that come up, and and basically, it's. I'm going to paraphrase it, but if if you're having some initial conversations and you know there's potential skeletons in the closet, do yeah. you just agree to that price and not argue over the point one of SDE, and and take care and go in and find a new diligence and try to renegotiate it, or or do you sort of you know. How do you handle when you know there's potential issues and, okay. and there's potentially something that you may I, have to adjust? I understand the question. And the answer is play the broker. Okay. In other words, um, if you're asking very specific questions and they're like throwing smoke screens or whatever, wanting to know if you're going to make an LOI, guess what? Fine. They're giving you permission to, to have due diligence, not be what you told, what you, what you, what you represented is true or not. Now you're getting into, Hey, I've got new information. They're giving you permission to renegotiate post LOI. That's my opinion. Okay. And the thing is, is like, you know, you can, you know, um, it's a tough one because again, it, it comes back to it. The way you play it is you ask the questions. If they're throwing smoke screens, wanting to know if you're going to party, go in with where you're comfortable at. Okay. Don't just overprice with the, with the purpose of going in to renegotiate, but sometimes that's what you need to do. Speaking on two sides of my mouth because of the broker. Now, what I want you to do is because pre LOI, you're trying to get to go or no go decision right at the beginning.
what I want you to do is once you get under LOI because they've accepted your offer, now get to go or no go, okay, right away, right away. Do it for yourself, okay, and do it for everybody else involved because you as the buyer can break an LOI at any time, okay? And, and I, I would go straight at, at those skeletons. And, uh, and I, I would answer it a little differently. We, we typically tell our buyers we're not going to retrade after we accept an LOI unless you find something material. But if it's new information, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if it's material, it's material. That's, yeah, it's material. That's, a good, one. that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. You know, they just can't wake up on Thursday and say instead of one five, you know, eh, it's yeah. I feel like whatever. And I think that's yeah. true. And the the only, the only thing I'd add to that is I would say like because of what you said, Adam, and I and I, you know, I mean, it's hard without knowing the specifics around the deal. I always say structure the deal to um, address the risks you're taking on as a buyer. Okay. Now, now. Don't hear this and run out in left field. If this is, if you're looking at something that's like a three times, okay, and it's like a million dollars or two million dollars, that's a cash at closing deal, folks. Okay, like you're taking it or you're not. This is this isn't like oh I want like an earn out and like a seller note and a hold back and a and by the way on seller notes, okay, what are you really getting? Okay. Everyone's like, oh man, I'm going to do this whole seller note. I'm like, why not just get it from the bank? The bank will literally give it to you. Right. And you can usually get a much lower price, by the way, if you show up and you're like, I'm cash at close. I got it all from the bank. And by the way, I don't really want to see you after about four weeks, like ever again. Guess what? That's a buyer that most sellers want. Right. For some reason, first time buyers are all married with this seller financing thing. And, and I think they think it comes with like no personal guarantee. Don't see that. Don't nope. see that. I mean, I mean, maybe in an off-market deal, but the thing, the thing with this like mythical off-market deal, I shouldn't say mythical because they exist, but they're a bit mystical. Um, it's like that dragon, like the dragon's out there, you know, but, but, like, but like the thing is, is like, it's usually taking advantage of a situation and lack of information. Yes. So if you can find a widow or a widower whose spouse was running the business who died like yesterday and they're like what and like they did no planning of any kind and all of a sudden you've got someone totally incompetent who ended up with a business and you can go in there and like work the thing like and you're the warm stove there is the buyer that's how those deals get done but you know it's it's uh what, what is it adam like like death drugs disease disability divorce. something like divorce thank you yeah so it, those are those are the things. So I don't want to say like you're a catfish bottom feeding. I had a friend. By, by the way, I had a good friend. A good friend of mine bought a business. Okay, uh, the the lawyer called him, an estate lawyer, and he said, "Hey, Brian, I think you'd be really good at this business." Um, he said, "Well, what is it?" And it was this e-com business that it wasn't totally e-com. It's a real physical facility, but they sell everything e-commerce. And the seller, no kidding, but was found dead in his Porsche, his red Porsche 911 with a million dollars in cash in the, in the trunk in a, in a, in a gun, a weapon, and he died and he had cocaine on his lap. <laughs> you might get the call, but guess right. what? This guy had already started two or three businesses and was known in the space. And so once you get the flywheel going, that's yeah. how those deals come to you people. That's how right. I got, that's how I got probably at least two of the seven, the three, of the seven companies I bought was the broker called me directly and said, I got this deal before I go to market. Do you want it? Yeah. I, oh, I bought all three. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's presume in our mythical uh, journey here that we've, we've sold the, the business has officially sold. Okay. Just maybe a, a couple comments um, before we get into some common mistakes here and, and wrap this up. Yeah. What, what are some things that you think people should be thinking about even before they buy a business about sort of post acquisition and making sure they execute. So this successful business that they are buying remains successful. Mm -hmm. um, number one, um, when you buy it, I want you already thinking about your exit. Okay. And you know, when you buy from Adam, talk to him about what the exit's going to look like. Right. And, um, I, you know, it's, it's out there, but the thing is, is I never buy a business. I never start a business without knowing, without having some con, 
context for it, like, or some plan that I want to follow in terms of, hey, I'm going to do this with it, and then eventually I'll sell it. Because what you're doing is building something of value, okay? And um, uh, the next thing is, I've already said it, but build up cash. Don't just start draining the company of, of cash. And I think that, you know, those two things will um, tee you off on the right foot. But after that, it, it's like, okay, we close. First thing I'm going to do is have an all-hands meeting and talk to everybody in the company and explain to them uh, what has happened. And I go in there usually pretty enthusiastically and I talk about why I love the business and like how important they are as employees. They're the infrastructure, by the way, right? They are the employees. And then I, I always talk about the vision for the company, okay? And as much as you can communicate that, you know, I was talking to my chief of staff, Chelsea Wood, the other day, and she said, make the, you know, with, when you're communicating to the employees, make sure they feel that the acquisition is happening with them, not to them, okay? And as much as you can try to capture that, you know, that's what you really want to do. So step one, employees, and on the, on the first day. Step two, customers. I always do customers, okay? You tell the employees first only because if the customers then turn around and call the employees, you're screwed. <laughs> it's the only reason you tell them first. And you can round them up real fast and get it done. Call the customers. Look at the 20% of customers that bring in 80% of the revenue. Schedule meetings with all of them, okay? Assuming, right? It's the type of business that works for. The day you close, your phone's going to be ringing off the hook with the suppliers, okay? Tell them not today. I'm talking to you a couple of weeks out. Right now I'm focused on my people and my customers, okay? And they're all wanting to, you know, all the suppliers are wanting to meet you. Um, so after that, you know, you really want to come up with a 90-day plan just in terms of, you know, people, processes, you know, systems, all those kinds of stuff. So, you know, you really want to focus on the humans. You want to focus on the cash. You want to focus on the processes and any kind of early wins, you know, that, that, that kind of stand out as something you want to hit. Yeah, I like to give people and tell them to get a notebook or give them a notebook and say all your ideas that you think of in the next 90 days, write them down in here. Yeah, because that half or more of your ideas, you're going to realize over these first 90 days weren't very good ideas because you didn't <laughs> understand the business mm -hmm. until you've gotten into the business and really understood it and and worked on a smooth transition with the owner because the last thing you should be thinking about doing when you're buying a successful business with employees and and customers and vendors and nice cash flow is making changes you're buying it for a reason yeah no I, you know like <clears throat> i'm not I think saying changes aren't needed but no, not but, not in the first 30 60 days yeah learn, no i i, I agree nothing. I agree. And I, and I think it's, I think it's also the deep, like there's a de this default answer that's out there. Like don't change anything for 12 months. Right. And, and I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't really agree with that. In other words, what I would say is this, I've seen people buy companies and move in and just start making drastic changes right away. Okay. I've actually seen it twice. That's it. Okay. And the first person created amazing value. Amazing. I mean, it was, it was almost like, it was almost like a, a house that needed to be completely redone and they had to like get it a little messy before like they fixed it. Okay. And it wasn't even a turnaround, but, it, but it, it worked. Right. And the second one completely screwed up the business and completely wrecked everything, including, you know, now they had um, a, a, a personally guaranteed bank loan that they had to pay with no money coming in. I mean, it was terrible. It yeah. was terrible. So I think the thing is, is if there's things, yeah, I, I like implementing change about month three or month, Four. And, it, and nothing yeah. big, but just like, you know, people do things one way because they've always done it. And like, you know, not, you know, I, that's, that's where you really, yeah, I, you can, you can streamline, start to streamline things without like major overhaul. Right. But yeah. just like you're doing it in an asinine way. We're going to do it this way. And they, and employees in that period, they really want to figure out what they can do to work well with you. That's true. They just do. So we have a couple of questions that I'm going to throw in together. They're semi-related, but um, it's sort of after the acquisition or part of the, the first one is, and I'll get, let you give the answers. Uh, is it common to take over some of the seller's loans after closing? 
i.e. machinery, tools, trucks, et cetera. And the right. second question is, is there, a per, is there a typical or average percentage of loss in sales customers or other due to the changing order that you've seen that you should sort of model and expect in your forecast? Okay, so it's one of these things where never, ever, ever give a bank um, a forecast that shows revenue going down. There's a difference between the, the one the bank wants to see, which is the business plan and what really happens, okay? Yep. I never buy a company without stress testing it. Okay, uh, you got to stress test it. And more often than not, what I find is when I stress test the PL, I actually get more comfortable with buying it. Like it usually needs to decline a, a pretty massive amount before you're in a rough spot. Okay. Um, uh, I make a ton of mistakes and I talk about them openly. And uh, one of them is every single time I've bought a company, I think this is true, revenue has gone down every single time. Uh, the year following. Okay. Maybe it's because the seller's kind of juicing things a little bit. Maybe like there needs to be reinvestment somewhere. Maybe I'm just not as good. Maybe the market kind of peaked out on a little bit of a cycle. Um, it usually kind of trends down like five to 10% after, after I buy it. Okay. That's just my batting average. And it's not statistically significant, by the way, I've done it seven times. Um, and, and there's, it's just a transition that needs to happen, but it's, it's usually not something that, it, it's never been something that's detrimental, okay? Like it's just part of normal business operations, right? Like if you buy a house, the value might go down a little bit, but at the end of the day, really do you care? Because it's gonna go up also while you live in it. It's kind of the same approach, like it just goes up and down. Um, what was the first question? What was the first part of that? Is it common to take over some of the seller's loans, um, you know, machinery, um, tools, equipment, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, most most deals are cashless, debtless, okay? Where there would be, you know, they would handle all the debt and take all the cash, okay? Right. Now, Adam, I want your take on this. I, I mean, mo most, you know, so, so like, like there was a printing company I was trying to buy and what happened was I structured the whole deal and then they sold it to somebody else on my structure because the only thing I wouldn't do is take over the loans of their equipment. And they found someone to take over loans of their equipment. And I said to them, oh, well, that buyer is not going to be able to make the business work because it was that detrimental to the business. And um, sure enough, uh, that buyer was very upset about nine months later. And um, uh, now if there's, you know, what do you think, Adam? I mean, I mean, what he's talking about is like, if I have a fleet of trucks, okay, let's say I have, let's say I have 12 cement trucks and I own, I own six of them and the other six have varying degrees of loans. Like you need that infrastructure and it's kind of a long-term loan. Um, what would you say to that? I would, I would quote Walker. I would say it depends. Um, yeah, right. Every, every deal is different. I mean, I would say though, 95% of the time we ask the sellers to come debt free. Yes, exactly. That's, that's how the business is being priced and sold and marketed. And so if they have equipment uh, loans on those six cement trucks, either they're going to have to take proceeds and, and, and clear those out. And the yeah. bank's typically going to want that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so we, we, I very like occasionally we've transferred a, a forklift. Because it was through a lease to purchase to lease. buy and things of that yeah. nature. Le leases I usually see. Leases yeah. I usually see transfer because it's not, you know, it's not. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, when it comes to like capital expenditures, it's usually cashless, debtless. The, the, only, yeah. the only exception to that would be, and this is part of what makes this market so inefficient, but the, but the only exception to that would be like a seller who's ready to sell but the numbers don't make sense unless someone's willing to take over this loan over here, right? Yep. And, and, so, and so that's the case where they might be talking, let's just say with a broker or you directly, okay? And it's kind of like, hey, I want to do this because it's right, it's the right time for me to sell, but the only way I can say yes is if this happens, right? And Adam, to your point, it should directly impact the valuation of the company. Correct. Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an undercurrent on cash flow. Correct. So, you know, um, yeah. Well, last, last, last topic that we had from our overview was, um, and we've, we've touched on a lot of these, but common mistakes to avoid Walker, you see everything. I see everything. We sort of laugh. Uh, you know, we, we talk about things in our, because you, you can't believe what some of the obvious things people do or mistakes. Um, but, you know, I will just say, and while you think of an, of a good answer, the number one thing that I see that, buyers or searchers make mistake on 
is not getting pre-qualified. Okay. Yeah. They, they just, you can tell 10 people go get pre-qualified and maybe two do. And they don't realize that like, what I always tell a buyer is if you're going to go buy a home, there's no real estate broker that's going to take you to look at a home unless you're pre-qualified. That's true. It just won't happen. Well, it's the same thing here. I can't, I can't take you to meet my $1.5 million seller if you're not pre-qualified. So, I, yeah, I, I think I, you know, I, I agree with you in certain places and it sounds like you've got great lenders that you work with. What I find is, is most lenders out there in the world are still of the mind of like, well, I can't pre-qualify you until there's a business. Like I need to look at you in the business and pre-qualify the deal. And that was, that was the default setting for the first um, 12 years that I, that I was searching and buying companies and, and it has changed. Uh, what year is it? So, so I'd say in the last like four years, it's becoming yeah. more, more common to say, Hey, let me pre-qualify you. Cause it's someone who can, you know, a lender can look at your, your you know, look at your PFS and, and, and all the rest in your income and, and all the rest of it and sort of pre-qualify you for a certain amount. But it's, I mean, Adam, I would say most lenders still aren't doing it. Right. So if, if I get pushed, there's like, enough good lend more and more are doing it. And, and, you know, that's where I think you got to rely on the broker. The broker is going to say, here are the good lenders in this market. Um, or here are the ones that work nationally that we know or we trust that you can get a prequal letter from. Yeah, I mean, th the other thing I would add here is that like, is that like search funds, like traditional search funds, okay? And, and I mean like, you know, the double raise, I don't actually have any, you know, commitment, but I have investors that are, I have backers and it's multiple, it's not one, you can't talk to one, right? I feel like there's a reason why their average deal size tends to be uh, between 10 and 15 million. Okay. And it's because if you talk to, you know, if you talk to sort of, you know, private market m &A advisors or investment bankers doing $50 million deals, or you talk to sort of main street sub $5 million brokers, both of those parties like absolutely laugh at the fact that these people with no, no, you know, committed funding are looking for a business that, you know, that, that they can, that they can buy and run. Right. They're like, so in other words, the first question of every seller is, do you have the money? First question of every broker is, do you have access to the money, right? I mean, like, like, and the thing is, is you can get it. You can get access to the money, right? And uh, um, I actually, I, I accidentally made an offer on on a um, twenty million dollar business uh, last week, uh, and I don't have the cash, but I I know places where I can get it, and um, we're working on it. <laughs> but uh, it's one of these things where, um, yeah, get pre qualified for sure. And if you don't know where to get pre-qualified, call Adam, call me, whatever. Um, and yeah, because you got to show that you got the money is the first part. Yeah. Um, what other common mistakes do you see? In the, most common, the, most, the most common mistake that I see, okay, with <laughs> business buyers is that they are trying to completely de-risk an acquisition. <laughs> and... The truth is, is that nothing that you're going to do is going to de-risk the fact that you're buying a business. Like you cannot do it. There's just risks. Okay. And you have to, you have to be able to look at the, you have to be able to look at the risks and identify the risks and then get comfortable taking that calculated risk while you do this. Okay. And if you can't make that leap of faith, you don't have the right growth mindset and the, and the right mindset to be an entrepreneur, period. Okay. You have to make this leap of faith. Now, me included, I had to make that leap of faith, okay? And once you start doing it and you start living this, it's like leaving the matrix. You can't go back. You cannot do it, okay? And you will ask yourself, why didn't I do this earlier, right? And the truth is, is that the magic is not in the de-risking at all, right? It's in what do I bring to the table? Going all the way back to the first thing you should do, attitude, aptitude, action. What do I bring to the table? Is this a good fit for my lifestyle? And do I feel excited about growing this business? And if you get those things lined up, th like the, the rest, you should just wait very little, right? Like look at the risks, understand them and make a calculated bet and go. Yeah, for all you, all the buyers out there watching this uh, live or recorded, I, I can't tell you how many emails Walker and I and our colleagues get every week from buyers, searchers, et cetera, that I'm looking for the following characteristics, you know, 
<laughs> I don't even need to start, but <laughs> yeah. now it's got Amazon proof, high barriers of entry, a moat around it. We want it to only buy it for two to three times cash flow, yeah. uh, recurring revenue. Um, Management you know. team in place. Yeah, no, no competition. No white competition. Collar, white collar, yeah, white collar <laughs> workers only, no blue collar. And, you know, about every month, I sometimes just write a snark email response and I say, you know, when that business comes in, you'll never see it because I'm that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm exactly. Um, I, I own, so, by the way, I, I still own two companies right now that I've acquired. Okay. And, and the thing is, is like, I, I, I run one of them uh, part time. Okay. And, and the other one, I have a manager in place. Okay. And I will just tell you that, you know, I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote my favorite documentary, Print the Legend. Okay. It opens up and the first quote is from uh, the iconoclastic investor, Brad Feld. And what he says is, when you're a leader, when you're a CEO, every day, something comes up and smacks you in the face. And that is true. <laughs> but there's no life that is there's i've just never seen a life that is more engaged than this one correct well i want to i want to jump into some some questions here and then uh we'll, we'll have final comments i got a couple uh questions that came up here um once if there is old inventory that no longer is used uh for the business but is included in the listing prices the seller is leaving the industry do you advise the buyer they will need to purchase this old inventory. No, if it's not if it's not sellable in the first ninety days, don't buy it. Correct. That, that's 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 an extreme answer, but I would say I would that's that's where I always land is like if oh, I'm right. not turning it into cash in ninety days, I don't want it. And, and I might we say as, we as brokers should be telling the sellers to be liquidating excess inventory before you even go to market or why you're on market that so they can capture the cash. Sometimes it's really it's, old. Sometimes I do. I just don't want it to manipulate the numbers so it doesn't look right. like real life. You know, right. and, and what's funny is I had, I had one seller who said, um, oh, no, but you just you put all that on sale and it'll fly. And I was like, OK. And then we talked to the buyer and they said, I don't want he said, I don't want it. And she said, that's fine. And so she did like a, it was a consumer products company. She had to buy one, get one free. OK. And no. she the business flourished. Like, I mean, it grew another 20 percent while we were under LOI. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and the, the funny thing was, was it was totally repeatable. Like you can buy this slow moving inventory and like sell it for half the margin and just crush. It was yeah. crush. One more question. Um, yeah. The broker always asks, do they have the 10 to 20% capital we talked about earlier for the down payment? The buyer does not currently have that, but they have the ability to obtain it through private funding. Okay. Do you as the broker discredit the, their interest? It depends. I mean, you know, if I've got a listing and I've got, you know, four buyers looking at it already that are competent with real interest, I mean, you go to the bottom of the barrel. It's just true, right? And by the way, that like I always have felt like this industry is going to barbell out and like the great businesses will get popular and sell for higher valuations and the lower businesses will sell for lower. So I think the average purchase price in this market is is not going to mean anything in short order. And I feel like I'm starting to see that. Are you seeing that, Adam? A little bit. I mean, people want HVAC, plumbing, restoration, yeah, electrical businesses. They, they, they just yeah. do. And, and when we have, we have one under contract right now and, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of interest and some, some buyers got queued on purchase price and ultimately it went for exactly what we offered it. Oh, totally. Actually, yeah, a, little, yeah. a, little, a little above act. Right. And, yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, is like, there, there's a little bit of a hack to this and it's something we teach in the acquisition lab. And, it's not easy to do, okay? It's just not. But the hack is that, you know, he said 10 to 20%, so I'm assuming this is a SBA loan. Yep, yep. So, so the, the, the hack is this. If you start an entity, okay, and you open a bank account, and then you get that, you know, that financier to put the 10 to 20% in the bank account, okay, and then let it age for two bank statements, okay, no lender looks at anything beyond that. And now you have an entity with the cash in it and it's yours, okay? And let's just say you sold 19% of the company, you own 81% of this thing, okay? And there's cash in it, right? So that's actually, that's actually the hack. And you know, if it's family and friends, like it might be a little easier because you can be like, hey, here's like a side agreement where like I'm gonna pay you interest later, whatever your deal is, right? Like work it out. But you need the cash in the account in order to get pre-qualified to get the loan. 
Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the hack. Adam, I have an in-person meeting in five minutes that I need. Well, to we are we are wrapping up, so that's perfect. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. Went a little over, I think. <laughs> so I wanted to um, I wanted to uh, let people uh, know how they can learn more about you. Or um, this is the opportunity uh, you saw. I had my my buy then build book. Um, but for those of you out here who want to learn more, Walker, give it a ride. Oh, you mean to pitch my own stuff? I mean, you know, look, what I'd, say is, what I'd say is, is that like, you know, Buy Then Build is uh, my mother's favorite book. Um, it, 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 it's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, it's, 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 look, I mean, you know, I spent, I spent 10 years spending millions and millions of dollars uh, investing in and running businesses. And then I spent four and a half years writing the book and it came out okay. Uh, so check that out. It's like 15 bucks or whatever it is. Um, we've got plenty of free resources on bythenbill.com. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I do have an online course, but the Acquisition Lab is kind of an elite accelerator where we've anchored in world-class education, uh, group coaching, a suite of tools, um, and, uh, um, you know, just, just tons of, of resources, but also a, a vetted community. And uh, in the last 18 months, we've helped buyers close on over um, 100 million in transactions. Uh, and so if, if, um, if, and I actually subsidize the cost currently. So it's, it's, not even, it's not even profitable. And we've had 350 people move through it. So um, I try to make things of superior value at extremely affordable prices. And if um, you want to get in touch with Walker or myself, any follow-ups, uh, we will send out a link to, if you want to watch this again. I, I can't stress to you how many uh, nuggets were in just casual statements. I'm a broker. I've been doing this for years. I've read this book. I pick up things in here. I can't encourage you guys enough to, to buy the book. Walker, it's been fun. Really enjoyed it. Look forward to seeing you at some future conferences. And um, if anyone has any additional questions, uh, reach out to uh, Walker or myself. Just Google us. You can find us. And we really appreciate everyone's uh, time and um, being here today. So thank, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Adam.